Welcome to our first ever Holly Church online worship service. Some of you have never looked better. And as for me, you've got to remember the camera adds at least 10 pounds. I'm really a sleek 125 pounds up here. And if we haven't had the chance to meet, my name's Kevin. I'm the pastor of Holly Church. And everything recently has been really shaken up. Kids are not in school like they normally are. You can't eat out at a restaurant. Some of you are not working. And it's really difficult to find toilet paper. The maximum people allowed at any physical gathering is 25, but there are no limits online. So I'm really glad you're here today. And if you're on Facebook, hey, just please let us know where you're watching from. I'm going to pray for you and for our country right now. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Jesus, you are worthy of all glory and praise and honor. Fill our hearts and minds with your presence. And Jesus, I just ask for each person worshiping with us to hear and feel and know exactly what they need to hear, exactly what they need to feel, exactly what they need to know from you today. I lift up our country to you. I ask for health and well-being, and I ask all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. As the worship team leads us in praising Jesus, feel free to raise your hands, sing out loud at the top of your lungs, clap your hands, or just sit there and soak it all in as we worship Jesus through song. Wonderful to me. Here I am to worship. 
am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my
You and Jesus, this is who I was, and this is who I am, and the difference is Jesus, your story can ignite faith in others. Thank you to everyone who emailed me their story last week, and some of you emailed that story and shared it with others, and it ignited faith in others. If you missed that message from last week, go to hollychurch.org, click on the media tab, and you can watch it online. Paul and Silas were two Christian men who lived in the early days of the church, and they traveled and they shared their story about how Jesus changed their lives, and it ignited the the faith in many other people. Uh, One time, Paul and Silas were in the, the city of Philippi. And uh, they had traveled there, and we don't know much about Silas's background before he became a Christian, but we do know that after he became a Christian, he was very bold in sharing his story and telling others about Jesus and brought many people to faith in Jesus Christ. And he was strong, Silas was strong in his faith and in telling others about Jesus, and because of this, it put him into some difficult circumstances at times. And we can relate to that because we're living in some difficult circumstances right now. Paul, on the other hand, we do know about his background before becoming a Christian. Paul was a very religious man, but he didn't believe in Jesus. He didn't believe Jesus had died for our sins. He didn't believe Jesus had died and come back to life. He didn't believe Jesus is the Savior who is the cure for our sin and shame. In fact, Paul was going around and arresting Christians, throwing them in jail, executing, having some of them put to death, and he hated Jesus. He hated Christians until... One day, he's traveling to go arrest some other Christians, and Jesus appears to him. He speaks to him. He blinds him. And it's out of this humbling uh, situation that Paul, our Lord, saves Paul and restores his sight. And not only does that, Jesus chooses Paul to be one of his apostles. Apostle means one who is sent. And Jesus sent Paul to travel throughout the world uh, telling others about Jesus and starting churches and building up Christ's kingdom. And Paul's story, just like Silas's did, Paul's story ignites faith in the lives of many other people. And Paul is strong in his faith and in telling others about Jesus. And because of this, he finds himself in some difficult situations. Today, we're going to see what happens when Paul and Silas are in the city of Philippi. It's a city in the country of Macedonia. Today, that country is known as Greece. And Paul and Silas are having great success there. They're telling their story uh, about how Jesus has changed their lives, and it's igniting faith in many other people, and they're baptizing lots of people into Jesus. And by the way, if you'd like to be baptized on Easter Sunday, we'll figure a way to make that work. We'll figure out a way for us to be able to do that. Just let us know. Contact us if you'd like to do that. And on Easter Sunday, we are going to have a drive-in church. Just think about like a drive-in movie theater, but uh, myself and the worship team will be up on the stage. We haven't got all the everything figured out yet, but we'll be sharing the details with you soon. But back to Paul and Silas. They've just had an amazing experience baptizing a wealthy businesswoman by the name of Lydia and her entire household into Jesus. When that happens, she immediately begins to help them financially, giving to support their work and telling others about Jesus. So everything's going wonderful. Everything's going awesome for Paul and Silas. And then this happens. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 18 It says, one day is we. Now, the person writing this is the medical doctor, Luke, and he's with Paul and Silas. So he says, one day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. 
She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. I think there might be a lesson in here for those of us who are Christians. The Spirit recognizes that these men know Jesus, that these men follow Jesus, and the Spirit can't help but just cry out, hey, these are servants of the Most High God. They can tell you how to be saved. The lesson there for us, if we're Christians, is uh, maybe we should be telling others about Jesus as well. So this went on, this crying out, this went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated. Now, I don't know why Paul waited so long to do this. The Bible doesn't tell us. But my guess is he's waited so long because, about, because of what's going to happen next here very shortly. But Paul becomes so exasperated that he turned and said to the spirit within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Now this young slave, she's now free. She's free from the spirit that had possessed her. That's good news for her. But it's about to not be good news for Paul and Silas. And it's certainly not good news to the masters who owned her because they were making a lot of money from her. In fact, the Bible says, Acts 16, 16, she earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. Now, it isn't illegal in the Roman Empire. In the Roman Empire. Macedonia, Philippi, the city of Philippi is in Macedonia. Macedonia is a part of the Roman Empire, which covered a lot of the known world at the time. And it's not illegal in the Roman Empire to cast a spirit out of somebody. But these guys that own this young slave girl, they're really mad at Paul and Silas. They're upset. So they go to the local judges who deal with criminal matters in the city of Philippi, and they lie. Here's what they say. They claim this about Paul and Silas, Acts 16, 21. They say, Paul and Silas are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. And then they, they spread this lie. They tell all their friends. They tell all their neighbors. They tell people to tell everyone they know. And so this lie goes viral. There is really nothing new uh, in the world. Uh, it happens today all the time with the, the media and, the, and social media where a uh, lie or half-truth can be told and people st- get all riled up. They get all stirred up and they don't even know the whole story. They don't know the truth. And this happened in the city of Philippi. Everybody gets all stirred up about these guys are teaching things that Roman, that we Romans uh, these customs that we Romans don't practice, and it's getting the whole city stirred up, and you're like, well, why is that such a big deal that, the, uh, that they said they're teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice? It's because when you're part of the Roman Empire, and you are supposed to be enforcing Rome's law, and you're the local judges, you're the local people who enforce these laws... You don't want the Roman rulers to find out you're not enforcing them because what they will do is they will come down on you hard. You might find yourself getting beaten. You might even find yourself getting executed for breaking Rome's laws. So these guys are already uh, concerned, and then a mob starts to form. And Rome, the Roman Empire, they hated mobs. So the local judges, this is what they do. Acts chapter 16, verses 22 through 25. They, they grabbed Paul and Silas, and they stripped them. They're stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Now, what this would be is you're in the, this inner dungeon, which is already, I'm sure, not a pleasant place. And then they have you sitting down, and they have your feet out, and they put your feet between in stocks so you can't move. And then they put chains around your arms on top of that. And this is a situation that Paul and Silas find themselves in. And then it says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises to God. They were truly obeying that biblical command that says, in everything, give thanks. And while they're worshiping God, a great earthquake hits the jail. 
All the doors come open. All the stocks come apart. All the chains fall off the prisoner. Every prisoner in the place is free. And somebody runs and gets the jailer and says, hey, your jail's unsecured. And so he, he gets out of, out of bed or out of his home. He runs to the jail and it's unsecured. And he pulls out his sword to kill himself because under Roman law, if you let a prisoner escape, then you as a jailer are executed. And the Romans love for you to suffer before you die. That's why crucifixion was one of their favorite forms of execution, because they could keep you alive for days and days and days before you die. So this jailer figures, I'd rather just kill myself and get it over with, and he's just about ready to do that. But Paul cries out, Acts chapter 16, verse, verses 28 through 33, but Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He must have heard uh, that spirit, that slave girl's spirit crying out about them. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. Obeying what, what Jesus commands us in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. How, how can you, like Paul and Silas, have your worship on? You know, have it be such a part of who you are that when... Uh, you, so that when uh, family turmoil or financial stress or hardships, troubles, false accusations, the, the, the coronavirus, how can you be like Paul and Silas and respond with worship when these type of things happen in, in your life? And how can you respond with that worship so it ignites faith in others just like it did with Paul and Silas? Their worship ignites faith in the life of that jailer and his entire household. Now, I don't like trouble or hardship or difficulties or this current situation we're in right now any more than anybody else. And I don't think Paul or Silas like those things either. But as I said, you know, how did they keep their worship on? I believe it's because they understood this. My response to pressure is, is not determined in the moment. My response to pressure is not determined in the moment. Paul and Silas didn't form their response to pressure in the moment that they were falsely accused, beaten, and thrown into this dungeon. Silas didn't say, hey, Paul, you pick out three hymns and I'll get the prayers ready. They didn't have time for that. And you don't either. You know, when... Uh, Troubles come into your life, they're usually unexpected, and they're usually unannounced. And how we respond to them is going to be determined by what's already inside of us. Paul and Silas responded out of what was already inside of them. They were so close to Jesus that even with all this trouble they're going through, they responded in worship. How can you and I be like that? How can we be like Paul and Silas, that no matter what we're going through, we respond in worship? Like everything else about you, it won't be by accident how you respond. There is nothing accidental about you. You're the sum of your habits, and when it comes to your worship, your habits, your worship habits are going to determine your response. So here's the five worship habits that ignite worship in your life. Now, these are very basic, but we so often fail to do the basic things that Jesus tells us to do. Worship habit number one, daily prayer and Bible reading. 
I know it sounds so simple, but we so often will let this slide, won't we? This is the foundation for a life of worship, though, prayer and Bible reading, because when you're doing that, you begin to recognize how Jesus wants you to respond to different situations in your life. Now, at the beginning of the year, we started this 100-day challenge, Bible reading plan challenge, where we were going to be reading the Gospels that tell the story of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that we were going to be reading them over a 100-day time period. I've been doing that. And it's just amazing to me what a difference that makes in my life when I'm reading about Jesus every day. Now, if you haven't been doing this, I'm not going to ask you to start at the beginning. I'm just going to ask you to start today. And if you need that Bible reading plan, we're going to post it on Facebook. And you can also email the church at hollychurch at centurylink.net and we'll send you a copy, or you could stop by the office and we give you a physical copy. And I'm just going to ask you to start today with John chapter 10, verse 10. On Sundays, we focus on a memory verse, one verse, and then tomorrow it'll be a chapter for the rest of the week, a chapter a day. And uh, now with this worship habit, the choice is always yours to make, uh, like it is with every single one of them. But you might ask yourself, why would, why would, maybe you want to respond in worship to things rather than responding in fear or anxiety and worry. Worship habit habit number two, faithful worship attendance. And I want to say you're all doing great because you're here. Nowhere in the Bible will you find Jesus and his apostles saying what we're doing right now is optional, that you can, you know, take it or leave it. Now, I'm not sure if you caught it earlier, But the place Paul and Silas are going to when they keep encountering that slave girl with the Spirit, the place that they're going to where where they just, Paul finally gets exasperated, the place they're going to is church. You may not have caught it earlier because they don't use the word church. Instead, Luke uses a word that the early Christians used for church, a word that, uh, a term that we don't usually use today anymore, but here it is. Acts 16, 16. It says, one day on our way to the place of prayer. The place of prayer. That's what the early Christians often called church, what we're doing today. And we know it's Paul and Silas's and Luke's uh, habit to be doing this. It's a regular habit because Paul is exasperated by this girl with the Spirit every week, week after week, and maybe even more than once a week. So to keep your worship on, to keep your worship strong, being in worship together, that should be at the center of your calendar. It shouldn't be, well, if I got absolutely nothing better to do, I'll I'll be in worship. No, it should be the center of your calendar. Now, it's also important for you, especially right now, where we want to keep connected, it's important for you to be reading all your emails from the church, reading the texts you receive from the church, letters you receive from the church. If you're active on social media, making sure you're staying connected that way. We're working really hard to keep us socially close. We are not socially distancing from one another. Now, we're physically distancing from one another, but not socially. And remember, when you're choosing these worship habits, you're choosing to fill your life with Jesus instead of choosing to fill your life with worry, depression, and, and any other negative life patterns that you may have. I mean, do those sound better than filling your life uh, with Jesus and hit, worshiping Him? Worship habit number three, serving on a regular basis. If I were to, to define what a Christian is in one word, that one word would be servant. Some people get a consumer mindset when it comes to church. You know, what can I get? What can I get? But if that's your ultimate mindset, you're never going to be completely satisfied with Jesus. You're never going to be completely satisfied uh, with his church because you're designed. Jesus has designed you to serve others, to make a difference in other people's lives. In in Christ, you're designed to serve. Serving is really one of the highest forms of worship in your life. We saw this in our story today 
the jailer, he hears the truth about Jesus. And then, well, let's read, read it, what happens. Acts 16, 30 through 34, the jailer says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household, even at that hour of the night. So serving isn't always convenient. Often serving is not convenient. Serving isn't always convenient, but it's always a blessing to you. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them. He's serving. The jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them, so he's continuing to serve. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced. They worshiped because they all believed in God. True Christianity is shown in our willingness to serve. And normally, we have a bunch of people serving every Sunday. But with the current situation, uh, we don't have as many. But I want to thank everybody who serves. And I want to thank you in advance for when you begin to serve again. But there are some teams that are still serving right now. And I want to thank them especially. I want to thank everyone on the worship team. I want to thank everyone on the the safety team. I want to thank everyone on the sound team. I want to thank everyone on the media team. I want to thank everyone who's on the prayer team. I mean, we really need prayer right now. I just want to thank all those people on those teams who are serving, continuing to serve, to bring worship to you. Worship habit number four, consistent generosity. I mentioned Lydia earlier. She becomes a follower of Jesus, and her immediate response is one of generosity. She tells Paul, Silas, all those traveling with them, she says, come to my house. I'm going to provide for your lodging. I'm going to provide for your food. So that takes money, money she's willing to to spend to support these church leaders so they can continue to share the story of Jesus. And when you give... You're worshiping, whether you give in a a physical service, which you can't do right now, but whether you give in a physical service, whether you give online, whether it's automated, whether it's mailed in, it's all an act of worship. And you might say, well, why should I be generous, Pastor Kevin? You know, why should I do that? Well, what you do is always your choice, but there's either financial stress or There's financial peace. One of the ladies in our church, she has two sisters, and she was telling her sisters how, man, her financial needs are always taken care of. She never has any stress with it. And her two sisters were like, well, how does that happen? We always have financial stress. And she said, well, I give to the Lord first. She said, whenever I receive money, I write out a check for 10%, and I give that to the Lord. And their response wasn't, wow, maybe we should try that. (laughs) No, their response was one of financial stress and worry. They said, well, what about your future? And this is what she said to them. She said, I'm preparing for my future, and because I give to the Lord first, he is faithful to provide for me today and every day until I see him in eternity. I know there's a lot of increased financial anxiety with what's happening right now. I also know the worst thing you could choose to do is when you're financially stressed is to choose not to give to the Lord. You say, well, I can't give. I'm too stressed. You might want to try giving and see what the Lord does. The work of this church is continuing. In fact, during this time, we have more opportunity than ever to continue to build Christ's kingdom here on earth, and that requires money. So if you only currently give when you're in a physical worship service, you may want to consider automating your giving, and you can call the church office, and we'd be glad to help you uh, set that up. You can also mail in your gifts. You can drop them off at the church office. You can use text to give. You can give online at hollychurch.org. You can stop by during the week, during office hours, and use the giving kiosk here at the church. Worship habit number five, praying for those who need Jesus in their life. When you decide to pray for those who you know 
need Jesus in their life, it affects you. Have you ever noticed that? When you start praying for people you work with or people you normally go to school with or whoever it is, yeah, Jesus affects them, but maybe he affects you even more. Your faith grows when you're praying for others. Your worship grows. Your story ignites faith in others. Your worship ignites faith in in those around you. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray together. Let's close our eyes, and you just pray these words silently as I pray them out loud. Lord Jesus, help me live a life of worship. Help me develop these worship habits in my life of you know, prayer and daily Bible reading, of, of faithful worship attendance, of serving, of being consistently generous in my giving and in praying for those I know who need Jesus. Just help me develop these habits in my life so that when things come my way, I respond like Paul and Silas. I just respond with what's inside of me. I respond with worship so that will ignite faith in others. Use my worship to help someone else know and be changed by you. In your name I pray. Now, keeping our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I love these folks. And I humbly ask for your presence to be with them. Alleviate their fears, their worries, their anxieties. Protect their health. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Amen. Have a great week. And next Sunday, March 29th, we're going to continue our Ignite series. And I'll be sharing a message about how your readiness can ignite faith in others. So that's next Sunday, March 29th at 10 a.m., But today, I want to leave you with this. No matter what's happening, my feet, your feet, are on the rock. My feet are on the rock I can feel the water dry I can hear the howling lies that haunt me You won't hold me now My feet are on the rock When I feel my hope about to break I will be the Lord unchanging grace let the waters come and the earth give way. I'll be dancing in the rain. My feet are on the rock. I can see the morning light. I can feel the joy on the horizon. Here my faith is found. I stand on solid ground. When I feel my hope about to break, I will bring the your unchanging grace. Let the waters come and the earth give way. I'll be dancing in the rain. My feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock, I stand on the ground and sink and stand so stomp your feet and clap your hands. Our feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock, I stand on the ground and sink in sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. On Christ the solid rock, I stand on the ground and sink in sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, our feet are on the rock. When I feel my hope about to break, I will bring to your unchanging grace. Let the waters come and the earth give way. I'll be dancing in the rain When I feel my hope about to break I will be the your unchanging grace Let the waters come and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain My feet are on the rock My feet are on the rock 
right feet are on the rock. My feet are on the rock. Thanks for watching. Have a fabulous week, everyone.